I'm Kelly Carper Polden. I'm from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, and I will be talking about the strategic plan for higher education that we've introduced called 60 by 30 Techs. What I'll do is give you an overview of the plan and then talk to you about some of the promotional communications pieces that we've put in place, including two websites, and I'll walk you through those websites. But as I say, feel free to step up and ask a question uh, anytime during the presentation. So 60 by 30 text was developed about over a period of 18 months by the Texas Higher Education Strategic Planning Committee. And that committee was made up of K through 12 representatives, higher ed representatives, and those from business and industry, because we wanted to have a true mix for students coming up the pipeline from the high school into higher ed, and then looking at business and industry so that we were meeting the needs of business and industry as students graduate from higher ed and go on into the workforce. We also got feedback uh, on, the, on the drafts of the plan. We put out three different drafts so that we could get feedback from across the, the state. And that way, we could make sure that the plan fit the needs, not just of the committee, but out in the in the uh, in the regions, in the, in the uh, other institutions, and getting feedback from across faculty, industry, and again K-12. We also held eight regional uh, workshops across the state last year to introduce the plan and also get feedback on it. So the plan is called 60 by 30 texts, and it's based on the overarching goal of 60 by 30, which is the educated population. That goal is to have 60% of 25 to 34 year olds have a post-secondary credential by the year 2030. And we want to make sure that people understand credential. We are including certificates, associate, bachelor's degrees and masters in this plan, which is different from the previous strategic plan, Closing the Gaps. So Closing the Gaps, as I mentioned, was the previous plan. It was introduced in the year 2000 and completed in 2015, and it became the foundation for 60 by 30 texts. In addition, oops, I think I skipped. In addition, the committee looked at the race and ethnicity of the state, and Texas, as you can see from 2015, has had a diverse population. It will be even more so in 2030, and the committee wanted to make sure that we have not only a diverse, but an educated population by the year 2030. So looking more closely at the first goal, it's a big percentage to shoot for, this 60%. And some people said, well, why not shoot for 100%? But that's not really realistic. And when this plan was being put in place, it was 38% of Texans in that age group, 25 to 34, had a credential. And so shooting for 60%, the committee thought, would be a realistic goal over the next 15 years. And one of the reasons that they decided on this age group, the 25 to 34 year olds, is that those of us older than 34 right now have a greater percentage of having a post-secondary credential than current Texans who are in the 18 to 34 year old range. And so they honed in on 25 to 34, wanting to make sure that that's the group that will be the highest wage earners 
between now and 2030. So that gives you a little bit of background on why that eight particular age group is selected. These are some of the statistics that the committee was looking at when they were determining why this, this goal was important. In 73, only 28% of all US jobs required a post-secondary education and the skills that go along with that. But the Georgetown Center on Education and the Workforce has determined that by 2020, 65% of all new jobs will require a post-secondary education. And again, that is a credential from certificates through masters. And the current statistic is that 41% of Texans ages 25 to 34 have a credential at this point. So we have a long way to go to get to that 60%. strategy to achieve the goal is to really provide support for students to get to and through higher education. And some examples of implementing the strategy that the committee had pointed out include developing and implementing education and curriculum delivery systems to make higher education available to a broad and changing population. And that's one reason why I showed the pie charts early on to show that we, we are diverse. We're going to become even more diverse, but we really need to be diverse and educated. We also need to develop practices to attract stopouts to return. And a little bit later in my presentation, you'll see a slide that shows the earning potential of high school only graduates, of those who have some college but no degree, associate, bachelors, and masters. And you'll see the disparity as far as the lifetime earnings especially if those who have stopped out. And Commissioner Paredes makes it a point when he's going out and speaking to groups to talk about how critical getting stopouts to come back and complete what they've started is because they are going to plateau and level off as far as their, their earning capability if they don't finish that credential. One of the, the ways that the coordinating board is trying to encourage stopouts to come back is we've developed the Texas Affordable Baccalaureate Program. And there were two institutions that initially launched the Texas Affordable Baccalaureate, and that was Texas A&M University Commerce and South Texas College, which is one of the three community colleges that at that time was authorized to offer bachelor's degrees. And the Texas Affordable Baccalaureate with those two programs has been so successful that earlier this year, the coordinating board announced four grants in expanding that program. So there are four more institutions that will be offering Texas Affordable Baccalaureates. But that's one way that the coordinating board is trying to achieve this 60 by 30 goal and meet that strategy of getting stopouts to come back and complete what they started. This is a snapshot of where we are today with this goal. In 2014, we had gone from the 38% when the, when the committee was meeting to 40.3%, and then in 2015, it jumped up to 41%. As you can see from the bottom, Texas will need to increase this percentage at least 1.3 percentage points a year to get to the 60% by 2030. And you can see the benchmarks for 2020, 2025 that will get us to the 2030 goal. These were benchmarks that the committee had determined as they were developing this plan, saying we need to get to those benchmarks so that we can be successful by 2030. The second goal is the completion goal where by 2030, at least 550,000 students in that year will complete a certificate, associate, bachelor's, or a master's from an institution of higher education in Texas. 
And as I mentioned earlier, with this plan, we are counting certificates. That's both level one and level two certificates. And we're counting master's degrees, which is different from closing the gaps. And the reason for that is many jobs now require a master's. That's the starting point, not a bachelor's. So we want to be able to capture those completions to count toward this, this goal of having 550,000 students in that year getting a certificate. So if we're successful by the year 2030, Texas will have awarded a total of 6.4 million certificates or degrees during the 15 years of the plan. That's going to touch a lot of Texans, a lot of people. So again, you see the, all of the credentials that we are including. And these are some of the targets that the committee determined were needed to help us complete this goal. We need to increase the number of Hispanic and African American students and male students. Female students have surpassed the number of male students who are getting credentials now. And we want to make sure that there is parity. We'd like to see it be 50-50. So we need to focus on getting more males to and through higher education, as well as economically disadvantaged students. And to be successful with the plan, we need to increase the percentage of Texas public high school graduates who are enrolling in higher education, especially in that first fall after they graduate, because if they decide to take a year or two off, it's less likely that they are going to go back and get a credential in higher education. So again, this slide is a snapshot of where we are today with the completions. And as Commissioner Predis often says, we're growing, we're going in the right direction, we're not, just not getting there fast enough. And we need to focus on getting to those benchmarks so that we can get to the end goal by 2030. I had the accountability team pull some stats for me. And completions rose by over 10,000 between 2015 and 2016. Of those, associate completions rose by 6,272, bachelors increased by 2,000, and certificates and masters combined rose by about 1,000. So again, we are improving, but we need to do a better job so that we can meet that goal by 2030. The third goal is marketable skills, and this is one that some people have a, a hard time putting their arms around. What is a marketable skill? It's a skill that a student learns in their programs. It's interpersonal, it's cognitive, it's applied skill areas, but it's those skills that are valued by employers. And what we want is to be able to have students understand what those marketable skills are that they're learning in a program or in inter extra activities such as being the president of an organization or the treasurer of an organization and knowing that those skills that they are gaining are marketable skills and then knowing how to communicate those on their resume to potential employers. And the reason, one of the reasons that the committee decided to have this as a goal is because of a national study where 85% of surveyed college freshmen identified getting a better job as the most important reason they had for attending college. Obviously, we know there are a lot of other reasons to attend college, just the experience of life, um, experience of learning. But the end result for 85% of these surveyed freshmen was they wanted to get a better job. So we want to be able to help them get that better job by understanding what the marketable skills are that they've gained by going to higher education. Oh, 
already said that. So these are some of the ways that the coordinating board has reached out to different organizations, uh, different groups to achieve this marketable skills goal. We've been engaging with career services at institutions because that's where many students go to learn how to write a resume or to talk about how they are going to learn interview techniques. Well, they need to understand their marketable skills, again, so that they can communicate those. Also, the chief academic officers, we want each program to be able to identify marketable skills and be able to communicate those to students. So working with the chief academic officers is important as well as the student affairs officers so that everybody is on the same page as far as what are those marketable skills. And the coordinating board last year hosted a conference so that we could get input from institutions and we also included representatives from TWC and from business and industry so that those marketable skills match up so that what you are promoting as a marketable skill matches up with those skills that are needed out in the work world and we're hoping to get a grant so that we can have another marketable skills conference sometime in 2018. So once we do, we will be sending out an invitation to all of the institutions around Texas. So the fourth goal is student debt. And with this one, we want undergraduate student loan debt to not exceed 60% of first year wages for graduates of Texas public institutions. This is a maintenance goal. We are at about 60% right now, but student debt, as you know by listening to the news, is out of control and we want to have that maintained and not go up over 15 years. If we can hold it steady for that period of time, we are really doing a service to students who have student debt. But not all students in Texas have student debt. This is focused on those who do. And this is a statewide goal. It isn't a goal that is being held for each institution or the student. It's statewide. We want this to be a statewide held at 60%. And to get there, we need to look at this balance triangle. We need the state to fund higher education and fund it wisely. Uh, we need students to be financially informed so that they have a sense of financial literacy and understand what it means when they take out loans and have student debt. And one thing that will greatly impact student debt is time to degree. If a student stays on track, stays on path, and doesn't have excess hours, they're more likely to have manageable debt when they graduate. But excess hours cost not only the student, it costs the state extra money. And that's one thing that we want students, parents, institutions, and the legislature to understand that time to degree is one of the ways we can really hold down and manage student debt. And as far as institutions, the commissioner often talks about efficiencies in Texas, and the efficiencies include uh, holding down tuition and fees. But Texas does a pretty good job with that, especially community colleges. Texas public community colleges are the third most affordable in the US. So you, as a community college, are doing a great job of holding down tuition and fees and making it much more affordable. And what the commissioner also often talks about is the importance of, as part of student debt, if a student starts out at a community college, that will help them hold down their debt, and then if we can have smooth transitions for them to transfer to get their four-year degree, they've started out with a much more affordable option by going to a community college. And with Texas public 
universities, we are probably about the middle of the pack. I believe we're about 21st in the US as far as affordability at universities. And if you want more information about that, it's posted in our Almanac data, which is posted out online. So again, these are some of the ways to achieve this goal. It's that balance of the triangle, but also building financial literacy. And since the fall of 2016, the Coordinating Board's Office of Student Financial Aid Services has been convening a statewide financial literacy group to look at ways on how to educate students about financial literacy. They're looking at apps that a student could have on their phone. They're looking at communication tools that, that financial aid offices could use to make sure students understand what their debt is. And that not all debt is bad, but you have to have manageable debt so that when you get out in the work world, you're able to pay off your debt, but you're also able to do things such as save for a home, buy a car, and do those things that, that everybody is wanting to do or it dreams about doing once you've graduated. So here's where the state is with this goal at this point. The percentage of students who graduate with any debt has decreased, which is going in the right direction, from 49.1% in fiscal year 2015 to 48.2% .2 in fiscal year 2016. It's a small drop, but at least it's going in the right direction. And this is the slide I talked about earlier, showing that higher education pays off. As you can see in the middle, those with some college but no degree have less earning capability than those who get an associate degree and much less earning potential from those who get their bachelor's degree. So again, this is why we really need to focus on getting stopouts to come back and complete their credential, excuse me, complete their credential, whether that's an associate, a bachelor's, or beyond. And this is a snapshot overall of how we're doing with the four goals and also with some of those main targets that I had pointed out. We're headed in the right direction, but we've got a lot of work to do between now and 2030. So that's the overview of the plan itself and where we're at right now. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Yes. If you would, please. <laughs> yeah. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one would be um, non-credit coursework leading toward a certification. Is that included in your count? I would have to check on that. I, if it's non-credit, I believe the answer is no, but I'd have to check on that. Well, because I'm the director of continuing ed, and we have pharmacy technician, medical assistant, massage therapy, nurse aides, all of those lead toward either um, certification or a license. If it's a certificate that's considered by TWC as either a level one or a level two, it is, it is included. They, they, sort of, they get an industry certification, so I'm assuming that you're not including industry certification. No. Okay. But those are industry, I would argue that industry certifications do get you more money and do get you in the door to have a better job. And that would be something, I will, I will take that back because, and for discussion because with closing the gaps, as the closing the gaps plan went along and different information came to light, the strategies and tactics changed and even at least one of the goals was adjusted, so that could be something that would could be looked at in in line with these level one and level two certificates. Uh, and and just to make my point, my brother is a licensed. He's a master electrician. He has a license as a master electrician. He's made far more money than I ever have with a master's degree. So I mean, I think that 
those are important skills to have. And my second part to that would be these uh, licenses and um, industry certifications. Uh, since non-credit coursework prepares people to for those career fields and to take the certification and licensing exams, maybe Texas should look at financial aid for those sort of for that sort of coursework as well. And that would be uh, the commissioner meets frequently with legislators and the governor, and financial aid and increasing financial aid is one of the main topics, so I will take that back to him and talk to him about expanding those conversations that he has. But I do know that financial aid is, is probably the topic that he, he, he discusses most with the governor and with legislators. Because you can get a much more affordable certification in a shorter amount of time than go to work and then prepare for more education while you're working. Right. So. right. Thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll go ahead and move on, but feel free to ask questions as, as we go along. So on this slide, I wanted to show you what we have done to date as far as promoting the 60 by 30 text plan. As I mentioned earlier, we've had the regional meetings, and we want to get a grant to hold more regional meetings in 2018 so that we can, we've talked to a thousand stakeholders. We want to increase that at least double across the state and reach areas of the state that we didn't get to with the first eight regional meetings. And one of the things with a regional meeting is we want to make sure that regions are working together, whether that's K through 12, higher ed, workforce, because each region is a little different. And your tactics and strategies in achieving the goals of 60 by 30 techs may differ from by region. We want to encourage conversations, partnerships, innovation, so that each region has its own partnerships, has its own uh, programs that feed into the success of this plan. So other efforts where you see the regional efforts, the 60 by 30 EP and the 60 by 30 NETX were regional efforts where El Paso as a city took the 60 by 30 text plan and have made it their own. They've adopted the goals, but they are working at a local level, and everything that they are planning to do will feed up into the 60 by 30 text plan to help us be successful. And the NETX is Texarkana College has done something very similar. They have taken the 60 by 30 text plan, adopted it as their own, and they are creating partnerships with ISDs, with other institutions in the Texarkana area so that they can try and get students excited about going to college and look at pathways either for a certificate or going on to get a, an associate or a bachelor's. And if you look at 60 by 30 techs, NE, NE techs.org, there is a video that they've put together with, I believe it's fourth graders, because it's that group of children who will be graduating from higher education in 2030. And what they did with this video is pretty incredible. I think it it's only about three and a half minutes long, but they've done a great job of using these kids to talk about what I want to be when I grow up and talking about they they have them all seated in an auditorium and they start leaving to show what the 60% is and then more leave to show the 41% that's current, and it's, it's very impactful the way they've done it. But 
we're encouraging these types of regional efforts so that cities like El Paso or institutions like Texarkana or even a region will take this plan and adopt it because your success will help the success of the state. Also, I was contacted by PR News, which is the Bible of my industry in communications, and was asked to put together a case study on the plan itself and what we've done to date to launch it. And that will be published in a guidebook that should be coming out any day now that will be used by students in communication around the world as, as a look at a higher education plan and how to go about promoting it and getting people on board. And then the last two are websites, and I, I want to walk you through those websites. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, you'll be able to go to these websites and look at what it is that I'm walking you through as far as the snapshots. So this is 60by30text.com, and the reason we have two websites that are both in support of the plan, this website is a higher level, kind of the 10,000 foot view of the plan and what it means to Texans. It is snapshots of where we are with the plan, and as I'll show you, you can look at the individual goals, and it's interactive. So goals that are statewide, you'll be able to see what the statewide data is, but goals such as completion have both a regional, uh, regional data and by institution data, and you can click on those and see how your particular institution is doing at that point in time or how your region is doing and compare that with the state. In addition, and let me fast forward a little bit so that you'll be able to see that, uh, the, this website does accommodate whatever device that you're using. So if you're looking at it on a smartphone, it will accommodate so you can see the entire website. Same with a tablet or with a full screen computer. So it's easy to click through. So if you were to click on the goals and go to completion, there are snapshots of data of where the state is and how we're doing on each of the targets that I had pointed out earlier. But on completion, you can also opt to look at region or institution, and it will give you the latest information. One thing with the region, these are higher ed regions. They aren't uh, the ESCs. Unfortunately, those are two, they calculate regions differently. I wish they were one and the same, but just know these are higher ed regions. So you can select the institution or the region and it will give you specific information. Let me go back to that. The what we call the hamburger menu, it's the three little lines if you click on that, you're able to download that slide either as a PDF or as a JPEG. So you can import into a presentation or use it for whatever materials you might want. And it's 24-7. You don't have to worry about trying to contact the agency if you were trying to get data on Texas or as a state or on Central Texas College, you can get that at your fingertips 24 seven and download the information as you need it. Also on this website, we offer, yes? I have a question. Uh, the information on there is based on Texas reportable students, right? Only? Yes, okay. yes. We have information under resources. So when, when we have 
presentations or a, a paper that is related to 60 by 30 text, you can go to resources and pull those PDFs so that you can use that. Again, it's 24-7. And on the events section, when and if we are able to have regional meetings for 2018, you would be able to go to this site and register for each of the, the region meetings. And if you weren't able to attend the meeting that was held in your region, you can also always register for a region that's adjacent, if that works better for your schedule. And then also on this site, if you click the Data Details button, that will take you to the accountability site. And that site is the second website that I want to talk about. That is the deep dive data. Where the 60by30text.com site is that big picture, 10,000 foot view snapshot of what's happening right now in the accountability system, you can get down into the nitty gritty of, of the data and you're able to do comparisons between two or more institutions, for example, on this accountability site. Let me get to my notes here so I'm on the same page. It is also uh, device friendly depending on which device that you're using. But these are the purposes of this accountability site. With closing the gaps we had an accountability site with this new 60 by 30 accountability it's much more robust um, and you can get a lot more contextual data, as you'll see as we go along. These are some of the audiences for the accountability site, which is similar to the other, but uh, again, you can get down into the granular data if that's what you need to pull. So this walks you through the site if you wanted to take a look at a specific type of institution, whether it's a public two-year or a health-related. You can look at an institution by each goal, and then you can drill down into specific data, degrees and certificates awarded. You can look at those awarded to economically disadvantaged to Hispanic students. So you're able to drill down to each of the targets to get the data that is current as of that day. And these are the different contextual measures that you would be able to go into to pull data. Again, by institution, you can compare institutions, two or more institutions. And you can filter reports. You can, there are instructions that show you how to create a report depending on what it is that you're looking at. It will walk you through how to create those filters, create a report, and then download that report. So again, you can download that and incorporate that into whatever presentation or materials that you are needing to use. And that's just highlighting. So this shows walking you through. It asks the questions as far as what data you want to see. And if you ever have any questions as you're going through this, by all means, you can contact me or somebody else at the coordinating board, and they'd be happy to walk you through getting whatever type of data that you need if you're not able to find it readily on here. And again, you can download all of these reports. So this gives a little bit of an uh, idea of when to use the 60by30text.com, when you might want to use the accountability. And the good thing is that you can toggle back and forth from one to the other. So if you decide you're too much into the weeds and you want to get out of accountability, you can go back to the 60 by 30 text site. 
So before I conclude, I wanted to show this quote. Governor Abbott helped us when we were launching the program or the plan, and this was a quote that I had pulled from his statement that I think is very impactful as far as the importance of the plan. He talks about how important it will be to the Texas economy that workforce, K through 12, higher ed are all working together to work toward a skilled and educated workforce so that we do continue to have a competitive advantage in Texas. And he is a strong believer of the 60 by 30 Tex plan. Does anybody have any questions? That's a quick overview of the plan and the, the communications pieces that we have in place. One thing I do want to mention, yesterday there was a question uh, about why we are not measuring quality in, the, in the, this plan. And I spoke with Dr. Gardner, again, he's the Chief Academic Officer and Deputy Commissioner, and his response was that we're not measuring quality with this plan because we can't guarantee quality now or in the past without imposing learning outcome measures. And to date, we've chosen not to recommend this measure, but he said we welcome feedback because he understands that universities and community and technical colleges may have a different perspective on measuring quality. But he also said we welcome feedback we believe in faculty and their belief in rigor, and Commissioner Paredes insists on rigor and regularly discusses it when he speaks to trustees, regents, and administrators, and we insist on rigor when new programs are reviewed for approval at the coordinating board. That said, he wanted me to emphasize if you want to provide feedback on a quality measure, he's all ears and would like to hear that. And one thing I didn't mention on both the websites, there is a way to provide comment, whether a comment on the plan, on the goal, on targets, on the website itself, or on something like this quality measure, feel free to fill that out and it will come either to me in external relations or depending on the, the focus, if you put in a focus of your, your question or comment, it will go to the subject matter expert in that area. But either way, I am the stopgap, so it would come to me and I would make sure that your questions get answered. So please send us your comments. Does anybody else have any questions? No? If not, thank you very much.